We believe that there is going to be an end time worldwide apostolic revival and harvest. We believe that. The verses I'd like to start with show you, though, that one of the things that has to take place before that can happen is that the people of God have to deal with their shame. I'm reading now. Joel chapter 2, verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Revival is dependent upon the removal of shame from the lives of God's people in this last step before the coming harvest. Shame lies to you about yourself. Shame paints a picture of you that it wants you to believe so that you'll never become what God wants you to be. The Word of God very, very clearly is attempting to get us to see ourselves like God sees us. Shame wants us to believe a lie. We do things that we know are self-destructive. We, know, we do things that we know that are going to be terrible. We have no expectation of it turning out okay. but we find ourselves doing those things and can't help ourselves. The problem is not sin. The problem is shame. Shame is the root cause that causes me to do those things. It's shame. I, uh, in teaching the School of Evangelism, uh, a short time ago here, I made the statement, I talked about the fact that if you can't get over the fact of being ashamed or embarrassed, then you're never going to be a soul winner. I was just in Indonesia. And I was speaking to the general board of the UPC of Indonesia. And I made this statement. I said, you know, the idea that Asians have a corner on the market of not wanting to lose face is ludicrous. I've never been anywhere in the world where anybody wants to be shamed. I don't know any people on earth that want to lose face. That has nothing to do with being Asian. That's humanity. Nobody wants to be ashamed. Nobody wants someone else to shame them. Nobody. That has nothing to do with your culture. That has everything to do with your human being. That's the way we all are. I'm going to make this statement. You'll have to accept it or reject it. There's not five people in this room right now that truly see yourself exactly how God sees you. There's not even five people. There's not a person sitting in this room right now that the image you have of yourself, what you see yourself as, who you see you, who that you see that you are, there's not a person sitting in this room right now 
that that image of yourself isn't colored by, distorted by shame. Not a person in this room. I said five. I, I, don't, I don't believe there's five. I don't believe there's one. And I, I know I have, <laughs> I have taught on this subject at, to some level or another since February 1984 when the Lord first minister, began to minister to my shame. And I'll tell you something. I've never seen an individual or a crowd yet that wanted to say, yeah, that's my problem. We all want to resist the whole idea that we even have any shame. It is imperative that we understand what shame is and how to deal with it. When we are fully free from shame, God will be able to give us revival and we will be able to receive it. First of all, I want you to notice. He said, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm. I have studied this verse in detail. And uh, there are different opinions as to what the Lord is referring to in these four insects. The, uh, the, the uh, uh, information that I consider to be most accurate is that it's actually talking about the four different stages of development of the same insect. Because the locust is actually destructive in all four stages of its development. You have the larvae, and then you work all the way up through, through, up through all the different stages until finally you have the full locus. Each one of those stages, the locus is able to do damage at each stage of its development. The problem is that little larvae before it becomes the caterpillar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't seem as destructive as the horde of locusts, but it is destructive. There are some things in our lives that we do not believe are all that big a deal. But they don't stay little. They grow. And the Lord said, I'm going to restore to you the years. First of all, the word restore there does not mean to give back to you what you lost. The Hebrew word translated restore does not mean that the Lord is going to give back what you lost. The Hebrew word actually has two different definitions that actually seem to be in contradiction one to the other, but in fact they are two parts of a whole. The first part of the definition of restore means to cause to be made to be at peace with. And you're going to hear me say this over these next several hours, today and tomorrow, tonight and tomorrow, as we talk about shame. The first step in dealing with any of this is to make peace with your past. You've got to make peace with the source of your shame. What is peace? One definition of peace is the absence of agitation the absence of something provoking or stirring you. So in other words, when you make peace with your past, your past loses its ability to continue to affect you negatively. Making peace with it. The Greek word translated peace literally means wholeness. So a person who does not have peace is a person who is damaged, wounded, broken.
those who act on stage, you know, TV and in movies, they're not the only actors. Every human being could easily be a professional actor. Because every one of us has learned to act differently than the way we feel inside. It's our defense mechanism. It's how we survive in life. We put on an act. How are you doing? Fine. Good. Really? You're really doing fine? You're really doing good? You really are at peace with everything going on in your life? You really are giving thanks in all things? Really? Why do we do that? Well, we're not intentionally lying. We just don't want to tell everybody what we're going through. Now, I'm not trying to be harsh here, but the word translated hypocrite actually comes from the Greek word hypocrite, which is re refers to the Greek stage where actors, and the way that the Greeks acted is they had a series of masks uh, on a stick. And the mask is painted to look like a certain character. And, and one person would pick up an, a mask and hold it in front of their face, change their voice, and act the part of the mask. Then they would lay that mask down and they'd pick up another mask. And they would stand behind that mask and they would act out the part of that mask. That's, that was called hy hypocrite or that was the Greek actor. And the Holy Ghost took that term from the natural world and brought it into the spiritual world and said that a hypocrite is not some horrible, terrible person. It's just someone who's hiding behind a mask. Someone who is not comfortable being real. Someone that is afraid that if people really knew who they were, or who they think they are, that they would reject them. So we try to project something that we think people will accept because if we were really real, we're afraid that nobody would love us because we don't love who we really are either. And because we don't love the person that we really are, we assume no one else could love that person, so we put, we pick up a mask, hide behind the mask, and act. Now, that may be the way the world does it, but while you've got that mask up there, they can't see Jesus Christ. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Now listen to verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. People are supposed to be able to look at my face and see Jesus.